This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. We have an older uh, walk-in cooler that is not working correctly. The manager keeps stating that the breaker is tripping, um, but he reset the breaker and it's been running since. He says that the breaker has tripped two times and the breaker that tripped is the three-phase breaker. So normally on a walk-in cooler, the three-phase breaker is just for the condensing units, but he says that when the breaker trips, the fan shut off. So we're gonna have to probably start up on the roof and then uh, see how these fans are controlled. It's gonna end up being one of these two condensing units right here. One of them's gonna be a walk-in freezer, one of them's gonna be a walk-in cooler. Um, I'll have to dig into them. Judging from the frost on the suction line, that is probably the walk-in freezer, but we'll jump into it, see what we can figure out. This is an old Norlake condensing unit. Kind of silly the way they're put together, but see what we can do. What I think is silly about these units is how they come apart, but whatever. So, I mean, I guess it's convenient. It just seems like a way oversized doghouse for a tiny little, you know, probably a one and a half, two horsepower condensing unit. But anyways, so the side panel comes off, the top panel comes off. But I guess that could be worse. I could have like no access or the panels could all be hemmed together. Um, so the condensing unit was running when I got up here. So what I'm gonna do, uh, again, I'm still just assuming this is the walk-in cooler. But another thing that's making me think it's the walk-in cooler is R22 refrigerant. On this other one, it says R404A refrigerant in there. So pretty confident this is my uh, walk-in cooler. Hey, check that out. We got some, uh, it's like barbecue sauce in there. Huh. All right, so we're gonna open up the electrical boxes and just kind of investigate. This is a 208 three-phase condensed unit. That was a 208 three-phase breaker that was tripping, but I need to look and see. We might be getting our 100, there might be a neutral in here and we might be getting 115 volts from this uh, condensed unit on the roof. But uh, I did confirm that the coil does have 115 volt motors in it. So sometimes on walk-in coolers, you'll, or most of the time I should say, the ones that I come across, you'll have uh, high voltage on the roof and then you'll have low voltage like 115 volts lower voltage at the coil running the fan motors and it'll usually be two separate power sources not one so I'm gonna dig into it and figure out exactly what's going on here I have uh, visually inspected everything I went ahead and came up with the amp draws of what everything should be um, we've got my condenser fan motor should be running at 1.1, the compressor approximately 9.3, but that amp draw is going to change. That's not, it's going to change when the pressures in the system change and things. So, um, but I'm just doing a visual inspection, okay? Looking at everything. So we've got a compressor contactor here. It does look like it's probably pitted out a little bit because we've got some char, some white chalky substance that's usually a result of uh, contacts going bad but I don't see anything there. No electrical shorts that I could see as of yet. I've opened up the compressor. Down in here, again, nothing jumping out at me. I have yet to see the system turn back on, but it was running when I got here. I've got the time clock section opened up in here. There's some funky, I don't know what the heck's going on here, something funky, but I don't see anything as of yet. We've got a junction box here, nothing in there as of yet. We've got a pressure control right here. Don't see anything. Then we've got a disconnect switch right here. Don't see anything abnormal. So again, we still have line voltage coming to the unit. Um, we're just kind of watching. Well, I'm gonna wait for it to turn back on, then I'll get some amp readings once it turns back on. And uh, I still gotta figure out if we've got 115 volts being supplied to our evaporator coils, which I have a feeling that's what's gonna be happening here. All right, so again, we're waiting for the units to turn back on, but we're gonna go ahead and do a voltage check on it. And let's see, I did confirm that where my condenser fan motor wiring was, I just followed the conduit. So this is a condenser fan motor wire. So once it turns on, we'll get an amp reading on that. Um, looks like power's coming in the top of the contactor. So line one to two, 209. Two to three, 205. 1 to 3, 206. So we have 208 three phase coming to the condensing unit. 
this is our breaker in question right here. So we're gonna go ahead and shut it off and uh, see if it shuts off the evaporative fan motors. This box is actually pretty cold in here, so I can see why it's not turning on up at the roof, but the breaker, that three-phase breaker, definitely turns off the evaporator fan motors, and uh, it is a 115-volt coil. So what I'm gonna do is just start looking for anything down here, just do visual, see if I can see anything that jumps out at me, and then uh, we'll continue from there. So there's nothing horrific looking in here. I mean, you know, never as pretty as you want it to be, but I don't see any obvious electrical shorts. We'll definitely have to open up this box right here, and then we'll open up these fan guards and look at the fan motors too. I went ahead and took the fan blades off so we can look in here and just kind of see. So on walk-in evaporators, the hot points, and someone did this one wrong, is right here, where the wires rub against the motor bracket. Same thing here. Someone has these installed incorrectly. The Where it goes through the bulkhead, right here, over here, and look at that, look at the black around that fitting right there. All I did was observe right on that black. That's not normal. And then look right there. Look at that. Just using my senses, just looking. So looks like we gotta fix some electrical here. The reason why that happened was because there's a slight vibration, likely because we have some bent fan blades, which is very common. These fan blades, like you can see the pitch difference when I stack them on top of each other, there's something a little funky there. Um, but there was a slight vibration and these things just shake and they eventually cause wires to rub out, but it also would have helped if that connector was tight. It's not the quite correct connector, I should say, for, that's like an MX connector, but it'll work fine for wires, you just need to have it tight snug so the wires aren't bouncing around so in this case the wires were just bouncing around and they rubbed against the top of that connector again we're not going to assume that's the only short so we're going to continue to look but we will fix those wires i'll go ahead and it's going to be a chore but i got to open up this panel over here so as far as the wiring goes if you're going to want run wire same thing goes with refrigeration piping it can run parallel to something but if it crosses something, that's when it becomes a problem. So this one is borderline okay because the wires are kind of running parallel. They're running with it. But the moment that you come over here and you cross it, that's a rub out. And that's a problem. There's a better way we could have strapped this. And in all honesty, I don't like zip tying the wires to the motor bracket because when these things ice up, I like to pull the whole motor and motor bracket out. In this situation, we're going to have to unwire a bunch of crap. So... Um, I'm probably not going to clean this up tonight because it's uh, late in the evening. I'm going to fix this short and uh, get them running and then we'll come back with some new fan blades. I think the motors are probably okay. Um, we'll, we'll have motors with us but we'll come back with new fan blades. So this is likely the culprit. Again, I don't know because the fans were still running. It was just intermittently touching. I went ahead and did a temporary fix, just ran a new wire and this is temporary just from one side to the other. I'm going to come back with some new fan blades and redo this electrical. Come up with a better connector. I went ahead and tightened it down, but come up with a better connector that can't possibly come loose. It's possible too that that connector just vibrated loose because of the vibration that this coil has. So we'll, uh, we'll clean it up, but this should get them going for the evening. It's not horrendous, but there's definitely, especially when you put your hand on it, this one right here, this side really has a vibration to it. Not so much, but this will get them going for the night. We'll change out those fan blades, possibly the motors, it just depends. And then uh, fix that electrical when we come back. All right, now we're running. 209, 207, 209, 209, 207, 209. Check voltage drop, nothing. Looks like we're getting some voltage drop across that one. I don't know though, it's weird, it's coming and going. Um, we're gonna go ahead and open this guy up. Oh, not coming off. I think that's a totally sealed contactor. That's silly. 
we'll probably consider replacing that guy just from the carbon stuff we see right here. No, that should come off. That plate. Oh, all right. Well, we'll look at it when we come back. Let's go ahead and test the condenser fan motor amperage or current. Oh, interesting. That condenser fan motor is over amping. Not by a lot, but it's allowed to run 1.1 amps and we're running 1.2. I'm sure it's well within the safety factor, but we could have a uh, capacitor going bad on that condenser fan motor. That could be a problem. So again, I think we're gonna be okay. I'm pretty sure we found the electrical short downstairs. We'll follow up tomorrow and go through it a little bit more, but we'll definitely investigate that condenser fan motor. It is the next day. I came back out to go ahead and finish this up. We're gonna start by removing the fan guards again. We'll go ahead and let their dishwasher clean them up, put new fan blades on there, and then we're gonna fix the electrical wiring inside the coil and try to clean it up to where it won't vibrate and short out anymore. Got everything pulled apart. Um, I don't think I need to take the motors out. I can work with it. I'm gonna go ahead and clean this up. Get rid of this connection point right here. We're gonna. My plan is to try to make it one solid piece of SJ cord, strap it to the roof all the way through, because the wiring that shorted out is actually, I believe. Well, we'll have to see. I think it's for the solenoid coil. It looks like it's a constant power source for. Yeah, because power comes in on this side. Okay, again, understanding the sequence of operation really helps. So power is going to come in on this side. We're going to take a hot leg. We're going to run it all the way over through the thermostat into the solenoid valve. The common's gonna, the neutral's gonna be there too. And then we also gotta bring a neutral, which it probably happens over here, a neutral, yep, right here. Neutral and power for the fans is up top. So yeah, this cord should solely be for the solenoid coil and the thermostat on the other side. So we'll try to make it one solid piece and make it cleaned up in here, get it nice and pretty. Slowly trying to rip stuff out, just disassemble, but not, saying that I've never done this before, but this is an overcrowded wire nut right here. This has three, looks like a 14 gauge. There's like three 14 gauges, maybe a 12 gauge in there. I need to go with a bigger wire nut instead of trying to cram all that stuff in there. Because if you look at this, it's not even, look, I just pulled that out without even twisting it. It's because it's overcrowded. That leads to issues too. So I always want to watch out for this stuff. Again, assume someone's going to come in behind you, but this looks like it's gonna be fairly easy. This uh, MX connector, cord lock I call them, is actually welded in because of the, the little arc that happened. It actually welded itself, so I'm not gonna be able to get that off, but I got an extra terminal right here, and I'll come in with the um, the cord connectors, the, I don't know what they're called, strain relief connectors or whatever, so. That's always good. I kinda had a hunch because I saw some rust down here, but the thing is full of water. Nothing sealed the penetrations. Even going up and even this penetration is not sealed. You can see the rust, so we'll seal those up for them and try to clean this up, make it look a little prettier. Slowly moving along. It's taking a little while, but I'm just securing the cord. I've got it connected with the proper connectors. If you guys can see, I don't, yeah, you can't, but I got the proper connectors, everything zip tied up. Um, let's see, I'll show you the connector that I'm using. I'm using an actual strain relief connector for the cord. So that way it holds them in there tight and then the motor wiring separated so that way you can just pull the motor out nice and good and then now i'm just over here in this mess this was a giant mess i'm trying to clean it up and try to make it look pretty my solution here is to bring the cord coming from the other side the cord coming from the temp control and make the solenoid coil the junction box and then try to get this up in here without rubbing anything out because before they just had a bunch of wires and again i I, you know, I'm not mad because there was wire nuts in there. I just figured I had the connectors, so I'm going to go ahead and connect it right. The solenoid coil's right back there, so. Almost there. There we go. It kind of worked out like I planned it. Wires are all safe, no problems. So, yeah. And I'll clean, I'll try to put some zip ties on that thermostat sensing bolt, too. But we're almost there, then. It's kind of polishing a turd. It's not a whole lot you can do. I don't want to move this too much because this thermostat's very old. And I don't want to break the sensing bolt, but we're good. Everything's free, not touching. I'll make sure I kind of maneuver it to where it's not going to touch anything and then uh, put the cover on. So I didn't have a new junction box. We can do that later. So I just went ahead and siliconed up the holes 
So that way we'll try to reduce the moisture coming into here, taped everything up, so we're good. I don't like that the supply house is put, or the manufacturer puts these stickers on there, but you're not gonna see it once it gets spinning. Got the blade on there. You wanna make sure that, that the it's inside the blower, or the coil enough, basically, and um, that way it's scooping the air from inside, but then also that the blade is slightly coming out, so that way it has the right pitch to push the air out and it doesn't recirc inside. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, start this up and then test everything out, test the thermostat, make sure I wired it all correctly. So that's always a plus, nothing exploded and it seems like it's working. So I'm waiting for them to clean the fan guards, I'll put those on, I've got some new screws for the fan guards. So we'll start putting the cover on the electrical and all that good stuff. And this is my pile of stuff that I pulled out of there, so made it much simpler, much easier. All right, so I'm gonna grab the thermostat and test it, so listen. So the thermostat's working and it's not shutting off the fans. So I wired it correctly, I did my job right. All right, at this point, I'm gonna investigate this contactor a little bit more. And what I'm concerned about is this chalky substance right here. Typically, that's associated like carbon or something and it's usually from the contactors arcing or the contact arcing or something in there. So I wanna see if I can get this cover off. I don't know if I can, but if I can't, I'm, I'm I'm gonna change the contactor anyway, just because I wanna be safe. Yeah, it doesn't look like it comes off, so we're just gonna go ahead and pull it apart and get it replaced. Before I start, I need to verify the voltage is actually disconnected and that the disconnect switch is working correctly. I have it shut off, so let's double check that real quick. Check, incoming, nothing, nothing. Nothing and for shits and giggles. We'll check the bottom nothing nothing Nothing, so we're completely disconnected it's safe for me to get my hands in here and start pulling this thing apart This is a standard 208 volt contactor. What's in here is a 25 amp What I have is a 40 amp so this will work fine. I Don't carry a lot of Contactors I just carry the common ones that I use so oftentimes we'll end up with one a little bit with bigger amperage rating basically, but usually that just means that the contactor itself is bigger. There's nothing really wrong with it. So, um, problems that kick in on my side is coil voltage on the contactor in there is on the top. That would mean that I'd have to flip the contactor over, but just one of my pet peeves, OCD, whatever you want to call it, the writing has to be right side up. So two screws and I can flip this cover around. Now my contactor is nice and good coil voltage is on the top so we should be good to swap it out I chose to go with the contactor with lugs because the incoming wiring is solid uh, wire and it's not stranded so um, I can make this work a lot easier and not have to use connectors for a lot of the points so make sure you understand the sequence of operation of these units because if you mix up the wires or anything you got to know how to be able to you know, figure it out or something. So you always want to be cautious when doing these. I'm going to do it line for line, but if I needed to, I could just rip this apart and stare at it for a minute and figure it out. So. Looks good. Everything seems nice and tight. Hopefully nothing blows up when we turn it on. So I'm gonna step aside, turn the disconnect switch on, and let's see what happens. So something got messed up here. What happened here? Going into that, going out of that. Let's go into the pressure control. Sometimes stuff happens, so I must have missed or crossed something because it didn't blow the breaker, but it's not turning on, so something's funky. Well, we'll figure it out. So I stared at this for a minute, and I just kind of traced out the coil voltage. I measured voltage at the coil, and I had 115 volts, which I should have had 208, so something was up. But what I realized was I had put this wire on the bottom of the contactor when it should have been on the top of the contactor. So somehow it got away from me 
power is still disconnected. I'm gonna put this on. It happens, that's what I'm saying. You gotta be able to understand how these things work so that way when something happens, you can figure it out. So now I'm gonna go through the sequence of operation here. So, power comes out of line two, and that's line, not load. Goes into the high pressure control on this blue wire right here. Comes out of the high pressure control on this blue wire, goes into the low pressure control. Comes out of the low pressure control, goes up to the compressor contactor coil. On the other side, we have a jumper wire from line one going directly to the coil. So now we have voltage going to our contactor coil. So let's turn it on and try this again and see if it blows up in our face or if it works. Okay, the compressor is running. Condenser fan motor is not, but the condenser fan motor is on a fan cycle control. Right over here is the fan cycle control. So theoretically, we should be off until the head pressure gets. There we go. Condenser fan motor just turned on. So we know the fan cycle control works, so that's good. I'm getting ready to apply my service gauges, and the suction line service valve right here has got two ports on it. And I just want to point out, because this may be confusing for others, Whenever you have two ports on here, you usually have one that's lower and one that's higher. The one that's the closest to the stem is operated by the stem. The one that's furthest away from the stem has constant pressure. So we would put maybe a low pressure control on this port because it's always gonna have pressure basically. But when we backseat the stem, this port turns off. When we crack or, or uh, screw it in or front seat it, this is always gonna have pressure. Another thing that you wanna be concerned about is the service valves, whether or not they have a packing nut. This one has a packing nut on it. So right here, right on the edge of the stem, I can loosen it. Okay, by doing that, I'm gonna extend the life of this valve because there's an O-ring in there and it helps basically when you loosen that, it'll make the valve last a lot longer. Now let's come on over here to this receiver and there is no packing, so there's nothing to do, not one that you can adjust. So that one you just crank. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply my service gauges and we'll continue to check everything out. These numbers look pretty darn good. Uh, my unit is running a clear sight glass. My superheat's pretty good, that's evaporator superheat. Um, for one degree, I'm not gonna go chasing that one. My subcooling's kind of irrelevant because this unit has a receiver. Uh, it, it's still worthwhile to take the subcooling reading, but when you have a receiver, you know, it's going to skew the numbers and we really don't use the subcooling so much, okay? But a, a super high subcooling would indicate something, but it really depends. You got to pay attention to where you put the clamp. So personally, I like to put the clamp coming right out of the condenser on the liquid drain because that's my true subcooling. If you put it further down, you're going to get a skewed number as the lines start to cool. Um, Everything's looking really good. My box temp, my, uh, my pressures are almost on point. My outdoor air is 77 degrees. We're running R22 refrigerant. Uh, looks like my box is still high right now. It's coming down in temp. Our evaporator TD is really high. I think in all honesty that, um, well, well, it's just, it's pulling down in temp right now. So it's going to be a little while. Yeah, so I'm looking good here. All right. So like I said, I'm using measure quick. My uh, sight glass is clear. Time clock has the right time. I did bring up to the customer's attention about the condenser fan motor. They want to hold off on it. It's okay. It's running about, what, what did I say? It's allowed to run 2.1 amps and we're running 2.2 amps. So it's not horrible, but the customer wants to wait. It's okay. It's, you know, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. We do normal maintenance, so we'll just monitor it and see what happens. I don't have a motor with me today anyways, but I did change the contactor because I was a little worried about that. Other than that, guys, that's pretty much going to wrap it up, I think. I'm going to go ahead and clean up my tools, watch the box run for a little bit longer, but I'm pretty happy with all the numbers. Everything's looking uh, honky-dory. So. Nothing too difficult there. It was a little bit time-consuming because, again, we approach these very carefully, making sure that we're looking at the big picture as usual, okay? So I didn't just stop uh, when I found the electrical short. I continued to look for more shorts, evaluated the rest of the system, 
um, found, you know, contactor maybe was going bad. It, I couldn't take it apart. So I just replaced the contactor customer decided not to change the condenser fan motor and, and it's okay. I really wasn't pushing the condenser fan motor to them cause I'm kind of not too worried about it. I'm just going to keep an eye on that. Um, everything else looked really good. Okay. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, really thinking about what you're doing. If you're making repairs kind of, I mentioned a little bit, but you know, you always want to uh, approach these jobs like someone's going to come behind you, basically, and and talk about you, you know. So you want to make sure that you're doing the best job that you can so that way they have no fuel. They have nothing to say, okay. In this situation, there's some things that the previous person could have done a little bit better. But hey, it is what it is. I'm not trying to be rude or anything to them. I mean, I probably have done those things before I've probably done that exact same um, thing before where I strapped them to the 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 evaporator coil brackets okay the line the electrical lines it's just you learn from it after maybe the first time you're like wait a minute that was kind of silly because now I got to cut every one of these zip ties every single time I de-ice the coils working in restaurants we de-ice walk-in cooler evaporator coils constantly because people are leaving doors open all kinds of things so Anything you can do to make your job easier or the next guy's job easier is the best. I always like to, you know, act and um, work to make it easier for the next guy, okay, in hopes that maybe I'm going to continue to be the next guy. But if not, hey, I'm helping out the next guy. That's the way I go about things. So I really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch these videos. Please, any questions or comments, leave them down in the, the YouTube comments. Send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. Leave me a Facebook comment. I do live streams Monday nights, 5 p.m. Pacific time, work permitting. So, so long as I'm not too busy at work, we go live. I talk about the videos. I answer questions. Um, it's a good time. Come check it out if you guys can. Other than that, I really appreciate it and we'll catch you guys on the next one, okay?